<laughs> All right. We are gonna take the next few minutes to learn from some pro legends in the space. Um, and so we're gonna talk leadership in youth sports, talk a little bit about culture, winning, um, and all that good stuff. We'll see where this conversation goes. We have no idea. Um, first, to my immediate left, Ahani Jones, entrepreneur, philanthropist, TV host, NFL player, and as any Michigan alums know, NCAA champion as well, and Brian Scalabrini, NBA champion who played 10 year, more than 10 years in the league, currently serves as the TV analyst for the Boston Celtics and has to get to work tonight down in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and I am definitely not a hooper anymore. If you see me play, those days are long gone. I, I don't care what he says. I'm not a hooper anymore. <laughs> um, all right, question for both of you as we get going. Um, you've both been on teams that have won championships. <laughs> What was it about the culture, the leadership, about those teams that enabled you to have success in that season or in that year? Dahani, I'll start with you. Or? Okay. Well, it's easy Brian. for me. It's those dudes, like those elite guys that set the tone every single day. Weight room, practice, on, uh, prepared for the game. For, for, when we won, it was Kevin Garnett. I went to two finals with the Nets with Jason Kidd. It's I always use, like, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, and then 60 people did. When you're around those guys every single day, you believe that you're much better than you really are. And it's not just me. It's everyone underneath them. So I always feel like the leaders are the ones that set the tone. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think it's a certain level of humility as well, mm. right? When you have uh, leaders on the team that excel beyond so many people's even – you know, our, my, my abilities, I'll, I'll say, right? Because I played with some great players, Tom Brady and Charles Woodson when I was playing on Michigan. And then when I, you know, when I got into the league, I was playing on the Giants and, and uh, Eagles and a couple other places. But, you know, the, the, really the talented group of people that really sat at the top and that had that certain level of humility that were able to teach the younger people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They were able to teach and give them little nuggets of advice, um, that allowed you to be that much better. I think that was a, a critical piece. So at Michigan, you mentioned Tom Brady, Charles Woodson. Like, how did they learn that humility? How did they learn those leadership skills? Where did those things come from that then, you know, they've obviously impacted that season, that team, but obviously they went on to do tremendous things in the NFL too. Well, I think it comes down to, to the coaches, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's having that trust and belief in the people that are giving them that knowledge as well. And I think that's such, so much of a responsibility on all of us here, regardless of the industry um, part that we're existing in, right? To be able to coach one another, to be as humble as we possibly can be so that we can teach, um, teach others. And, I, and you know, it's, it's hard to say to, to Charles Woodson, who's arguably one of the greatest cornerbacks, greatest safeties, greatest wide receivers um, in, in the National Football League and college football, um, how to be humble, but he, he's got a little bit of it. He's <laughs> got a little enough. bit of it, right? Um, and, Tom, and, and Brady Brady the same, but they also recognize how they got to where they are today, right? They recognize how they got to be where they are on the field. And sure, they had their selfish moments, but they had a lot of selfless moments where they realized that in this team sport, they couldn't excel without those that are around them being just as strong or trying to achieve just like they are. Got it. And just to add to that, I always feel like the great guy, the great players, right? They know what's important and they focus on that and they can block out all the other stuff. They just have this unique ability to understand or to tell you, this is what you need to do. Did anybody watch last night? Lakers, Nuggets, LeBron was mic'd up. Every amount of information he was giving Anthony Davis was spot on. There was no wasted information there. And I think those guys, they just have a way of knowing exactly what we need to do today to win this game or what we need to do in practice to get, you know, to be a championship level team. I got a chance to coach Steph Curry in Golden State and I was blown away how humble he was, how hard he worked, and how nothing, nothing, 10 shots in a row he can miss, five turnovers in a row, nothing bothered him. He just moved on to the next play. And that's a special gift. I think, I don't know how it was for you, but for me, it was like any. Like, like I, if I made a mistake, it was like a little bit tough for me to get through it. You, you know, you're like, man, I got to make this next shot or I'm going to get taken out. Mm -hmm. So those guys could just move past it. I play with Ray Allen. Ray Allen can miss 10 shots in a row. It doesn't matter. He's taking the next one like he's going to make it. What did, what did you do 
to teach yourself to get past it? Like, what was the... I would just have to make a play. It could be a defensive play. Uh -huh. You just know there's like, okay, you know, if I miss that three or if I turn the ball over, I have to make a play to get it back. And you get, become hyper-focused on trying to make the right play. Uh -huh. yeah, one of the things uh, my sports psychologist taught me, and, and I didn't really believe in sports psychology uh, for a long time because I was like, what's this guy, what are they gonna teach me that I don't know better myself, right? Uh -huh. Um, I think about as an athlete, you're really like a startup, right? And as a founder of your own team, you have to have like the greatest amount of knowledge mm -hmm. in yourself and also your abilities. And, and I didn't really recognize this until sort of my, uh, I'd say my seventh year in the, in the league when I was playing on the Bengals and sports psychologist, a guy named De uh, Dr. Uh, Gantshirt, he was like, Dahani, you know, in any of these situations, I'll, I'll just give you a little nugget. I was like, I don't want your nuggets. <laughs> he was like, no, 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 listen. And he'd just walk up, you know, like, I'm going to teach you something. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> and, you know, you get to be a certain age, and you're like, okay, I don't really, you're not going to really teach me anything new. And he said, look, it's just really simple. Recognize, regroup, and refocus. Mm. And I was like, I don't believe you, Right? So I just kind of completely ignored him. And then I got out there and missed a tackle. I was like, I got to recognize what I did wrong. I got to regroup and get myself together. I got to refocus. And I was like, oh, man, next, next time I came out, shot the gap, made the play. I was like, oh, this is perfect. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's, that's how, you know, I, I didn't always sort of wrestle with whatever just happened. Um, you know, you kind of compartmentalize things as an athlete. You know, you have to be able to do that. You know, he was just talking about being a triathlete. If you're tired, you got to figure out how to, like, keep paddling. You know, just keep swimming. Just keep swimming, right? Just Every, keep swimming. Right? Yeah, just exactly. keep swimming. Right. So you have kids. <laughs> um, but it's the same thing cycling. You know, you just got to keep, you know, pedaling, running. Whether you're at Kona, my sister just ran Kona, right? So you just got to keep running in the dark, right? One foot in front of the next. Um, but it's that recognize, regroup, and refocus, in my opinion, that helps you kind of continue and forget about what happened in the past and move on to the next step. Yeah, and I would add to that is, um, you know, not every elite athlete is going to sit there with their hands on their knees, like absorbing everything you say with a head nod. That's a lot of... I don't it, think any elite athlete Yeah, yeah a lot of elite athletes... <laughs> I, they, I, I, don't, I don't know any... I definitely no, don't do no, it. No, no, 100%. Yeah, you you know, I know we're elite right. athletes but up I, here. But, but you would say that the information always comes through, and you decide what well, to do Well, no, with I it. definitely know there's a lot of people that the information doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, hey, Donnie, what am I supposed to do on this play? You know, I'm not naming any names. <laughs> but... Remember, if you're, if you're telling them, a lot of times it is getting through and they'll go out there and do it. And maybe they do it on their time. Maybe they do it a week later. Maybe you miss a tackle and then the next time out, you get it right and you're like, yeah, you know, I can use that. So it's not always going to be like, you know, high school win one for the Gipper or anything like that. But keep on, you know, uh, trusting your message. So when you were coaching, I'm, I'm thinking back to, to the Warriors, were you thoughtful in how you approached each individual player? Did you say, oh, I could talk to Steph like this, I could talk to Clay like that? Like, how, how do you think about that? I'm going to be honest with you, it was my first year coaching. You didn't talk I, to anybody? I think I did a good job. <laughs> I was like, this is, I had to learn all that on the fly, as well as breaking down 80 hours of film, and I was, yeah. I was barely, barely, barely treading water. So, um, I did know one time, because every time we had a defensive possession, a big defensive possession, we would take Steph Curry out of the game. So one day, we're doing a scrimmage. And I thought, well, this is what we do in the game. Yo, Steph, let's go, man. We, we got this one defensive stop we need. And he was like, he looked at me like, Psh, like, I'm not listening to you, man. I'm just going <laughs> to be out here. I, hey, Steph, we, we, one stop. And he just stayed out there. So the, like, I learned right away, like, I ain't telling him what to do. <laughs> Even though he's super humble and, like, the great, he just, he was right. He was right. I was wrong. He's like, I'm not rolling like that. I'm not, I'm not checking out of a practice. But that, he didn't even want to come out in the game. Can you imagine practice? So yeah. that's just the way he was. He's, he's all right. Pretty good. He's all right. Um, Dahani, you played for Andy Reid when you were in, the, in, in Philly. Um, what was he like as a coach? What did you learn from him? He's obviously gone on to have, you know, continued success in the league for a long time. Uh, Andy's an interesting guy. Um, they call him the big guy. <laughs> and he's always going to be the big guy in my brain. Um, 
I think he did the best job at um, managing through situations and by designating certain people to have control of particular moments, right? When you break down a, an NFL game, obviously you, you kind of have coaches sometimes or head coaches that want to have dominion over everything. And I don't think that um, breeds as much success as true um, designation when it comes to like your offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. Um, at the time, uh, Jim Johnson was my defensive coordinator. I think he did a, a fantastic job. Rest his soul, he's passed. Um, but Andy really allowed him full control of the defense. And I think that's one thing that Andy taught me, right? It's like, if, if there are people that you're willing to work with, give them the control that you gave, that you want to give them. Don't extract the power from him or them or her and all of a sudden say, you know, it, it, you're not in control anymore, I've got that control. So I think that's one thing he taught me. I think number two, uh, he created an inner circle within the team. He's, he's always been really good about that by establishing leaders on the team um, that he could kind of source information from the, from the team and then bring it directly to him, right? You, know, you have like, you know, a bunch of guys on the roster, everybody's got their different opinions. You can kind of create a small council of people that can report to him about like what's happening in the locker room, what's happening on the field. And so that he can always update, change, designate, decide different things that happen on the, on the field, on and off the field. So he did a really good job with that. Um, and then, you know, he would always, he's, he was really quick with his, um, with his notes. Mm. He wasn't long in his delivery. He didn't give you a paragraph. He gave you a set, you know, quick sentence um, that I think oftentimes, you know, just a quick bite matters more than a paragraph because most people forget everything, you know, 95% of what you say. Yeah. They just remember that one, that one phrase or that one moment. I would agree with that. I, I think now I do some coaching now with young kids. Like if you stop and want to talk to everybody, it doesn't work. I, we, pla we practice a lot of music. I turn the music down, say like, we got to fill the corners, got to hold the corners. Turn the music back up and let them go. It, it's, the message is better, the reps are better. I, I just think long-winded stuff doesn't work when you're talking to, to kids. I mean, you, you've seen TikTok, it's like five seconds long, that's what they love, so. Yeah. They're not paying attention for like 20 seconds. Well, you work in t uh, TV too, right? So get your point across in about you seven seconds, quick. otherwise you're gonna you lose things. out before that ball crosses half court, so. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. Well, I was also gonna say, it's, it's really important as a, as a coach and as a leader of a company to understand who your employees are and who your, who your kids are too. For sure. Right, so, some kids you might have to sit down, you know, and you know, and have a discussion with them. Others, you just kind of yell things out. So, you know, while I might be able to give the advice of just delivering just like a quick sentence and message, that person may not learn that way. I mean, we're living in a more and more customizable experience, and I think sports has always been that way, right? Um, I don't know, maybe that's not mm -hmm. true. No, I get that. Like, because in high school, my coach really didn't care how I, how I learn anything. No, they didn't care about how you <laughs> They didn't care about it. My, my coach was like, do this. I was like, okay, I'll figure it out, right? But now in a more customized, quick um, learning experience, people want to have those things that are more tailored to who they are. So learning who your uh, kids are, learning who your other employees are and people are with your business is really important. We heard that um, the previous speakers talk a little bit about you know their challenges or their failures. So can you share, um, both of you, a, a challenge or a failure or a struggle in which you learned a particularly meaningful lesson? Have you seen me play? <laughs> <laughs> you see my ability? I'm living in a world of bigger, faster, stronger every single day, right? So um, I just trusted my work. If I always played bad, and but I always left the next day good, like feeling good. I mean, my margins are small. If I check into a game, think about it. Like, let's say I get three shots, and I'm, I go one for three or two for three. That's a big difference when I drive home that night, right? Let's say I blow one defensive assignment in, in eight minutes. That's going to hurt me, right? So to me, it was all about the work. I just trusted my work the next day. And... You know, I, in, in basketball, I don't know how it is in football, but in basketball, we can always play one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two, three-on-three. So if I didn't like the way I played, I would pull people aside. Let's bump today. Let's play two-on-two. -two, let's play three-on-three. -three. And then by the time, you know, nine to ten working out, ten to twelve practice, twelve to one, everything else I need to do, I'm driving home feeling pretty good about myself. And it doesn't – for me, it never lasted 24 hours. I always knew that if something – like if – 
And by the way, when I was a kid, I compartmentalized like that. It's not like I lived in this like perfect life or anything like that, but anything went wrong, I go to the park and play hoops. So I've been doing that my whole life. And even now at 45, my wife starts yelling at me, I'm going to the gym. Like that's just what I'm doing. <laughs> so like, I've been doing that since I was like 10 years old. So, yeah. and by the time I come back, that, that argument about leaving the toothpaste out isn't that bad. <laughs> See, you go to the gym, and I just get a bowl of ice cream. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that all works. That all works. Uh, you know, I think we've all had our, our, our shares of ups and downs. I mean, when I first got into the league, I tore my ACL. So I learned a lot about myself coming out of the gate, that I had a certain amount of resilience, right, and belief in myself that I could find my way back into the league. I think that was, that was like, one thing that was a challenge and that I also kind of learned about myself. I think you learn a lot about yourself when you get fired. Um, and I got cut from the, you know, cut from the Eagles, um, and there was a little bit of a differing of opinion. But you know, I still stand on my choice to train away from the team, and so that was kind of like a reinforcement from my own resilience that I had when I tore my ACL. That sometimes you got to do the things that you need to do to take care of you, right? Like you can only, you're the, as an athlete, your your coach is your greatest indicator of like. Um, your coach will be your greatest indicator of your own greatness, but you have to be able to understand how great you are too, right? And I think that's really a, a key component. Um, and I think last, uh, an another challenge was once I got cut from the Eagles um, and, I, and I went to the Bengals, uh, I learned a lot about myself because one of, the, one of the reasons why they cut me from the Eagles is because they said I was a little distracting, right? I'm like, you talking about I just like to do different things and they're like well we need you to focus on football right and I was like okay I'll focus on football but I want to do different things too right and it didn't necessarily work for them and when I got a uh, an opportunity to play for the for the Bengals um, I got a one-year contract right because ours aren't guaranteed uh, I know I heard <laughs> I got I got I got a, I got a one-year I got a one-year contract and I had to make a decision during that one year contract, because at the very end, I had an opportunity to do this travel show. And, I, and, and I, in my head, I was like, oh, I can't tell anybody because they might, they might cut me, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't tell anybody. I traveled, went to different places and came back. And, um, and I ended up not telling anybody. I got a contract with the Bengals and I ended up doing my TV show as well. And it was kind of cool because going through the uh, going through the cafeteria, uh, Mike Brown came up behind me and he was like, he said he tapped him on the shoulder and I was kind of nervous because I was like, what, what does he want to talk to me about? And he's like, my wife makes me watch your TV show every Monday night, <laughs> right? And and for those who don't know, I traveled around the world, played different sports in 20 different countries uh, at the professional level, everything from Muay Thai to uh, Prado Saray. Um, to dragon boat racing and you know and sailing down in New Zealand, and what I learned what, what I learned that day is, as I mentioned before, understand your own greatness, but understand what makes you know what makes you good, how you work best is important, but then also those that you work with, them understanding how you work best yeah. as well, and so that you know I ended up playing for the Bengals on one side of the street, and then at the same time working for the Scripps Network, which was on the other side of the street. So uh, everything works out for um, a reason. Yeah, I, um, I think about that too. I, I will never forget, I was a teenager, and I, it was the first coach who ever told me, well, you have to work on your strengths as much as you work on your weaknesses. Like, I'd always can't, like, oh, I'm left footed. You gotta get your right foot better. You gotta get your right foot better. Yeah, well, the reason I made the national team because my left foot was pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I respect that tremendously. Um, Last couple of questions, and, and Dahani, you made me think about this, but um, you both have talked about knowing your kids and knowing the people you coach. You talked about the idea of wanting to do stuff outside of football. How important is like thinking about the whole human, not just the athlete? Like, where is the human in all of in all of this? Particularly as you get to pro sports, where it seems like the focus is on winning, 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 and producing, and all of those things. I, I think that's a tough. Tough question, uh, especially now when the the tracks that kids have to be on are so narrowed. Um, and for me, as a, a parent of, of three kids, I, I always emphasize to them: play multiple sports, spend time in multiple disciplines. 
work with your right foot and your, and your left foot. Um, if you're going to go swim, I want you to do you know, freestyle. I also want you to do breaststroke, backstroke, right? I want you to go kayak, and I want you to go canoe. I want you to get on your bike. Uh, I want you to do road bike, and I want you to do mountain bike, right? So I'm always trying to preach to my children to be able to vary their background. I think it's hard nowadays when you have, um, you know, travel, um, you have uh, your, your school, right? And then you have, you know, an, another one on top of that. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, I think it's really important for the parents to decide uh, within your family what you think is going to be best for that child mm -hmm. um, and what you feel as though is going to be the best track for them. I know for, as I said, for my kids, they're not going to just do one thing. They're going to do several things. So I know that formula works. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not the best to answer this question. I don't care about winning, I don't. But I do care about like a kid's floor. I think this is big in youth sports, right? And I think I, I could say emotional fans are the same way. Like I do the broadcasting for the Boston Celtics. I think a lot of fans and parents look at their kid's ceiling and that's great, you should. Like what can your kid do when they're at their best? I think if you start talking to coaches in college or like in where I live, it's like the private high schools, those guys are looking, or, or, or women, those people are looking at the floor of your kid, right? So you gotta be honest with yourself in that. If, you're, if your kid hits six threes and turns the ball over nine times and doesn't play any defense, there's your floor. And a lot of people may look at the six threes, but ultimately the playing time comes from the floor. So when you say, uh, like winning, right? I don't like that's they're still up in the air, man. We could play a team and play awful, win by 80. We could play an unbelievable game and lose by 20, right? It's it's not that. And you know how AAU can get it can, it's crazy the competition level, right? But I will say there's it from an athletic standpoint, and I don't know all sports, I don't. Maybe for football, it's the way you wrap up or tackle or whatever it is, and for I, I for maybe for it's route running, whatever it is. I know what it is for basketball, right? So I focus mostly with the kids on increasing their floor. I, I know how kids love it. They watch the highlights. They try the step backs. That's great. I think you should. But my main focus when I'm working with kids is to bring up your floor, your defense, your on-ball defense, your low turnovers, your ball handling, your left hand. You know, like I'm trying to raise that up because ultimately if you want to play at the highest level, let's just use college. You want to get a scholarship. I guarantee you, I've seen it time and time again. The most miserable people on a college campus are the athletes that aren't good enough to be there. And it happens all the time. I guarantee you it's happening 20%, 30% of the kids that get their scholarship and they walk on and they are never going to be good enough for whatever reason. Maybe their floor isn't high enough. So for me, when you talk about winning, what do you focus on or balance or anything like that? I have other people to do that, right? Like my wife is good for that, right? I... I am trying to get their floor as high as I possibly can. How well can you handle with your eyes up? You can make a pass that gets through. It's a terrible pass. You can jump in the air, fall backwards, throw it, and it can get through. But against the best of the best or when you move on to the next level, that pass gets you on the bench. So if you're asking me what I do when I'm in practice, is like I am constantly trying to raise the floor of each kid. Yeah, that's great. Um, so last question, we have a wonderful group of you know, youth sports leaders in this room. So what's one piece of advice or one takeaway that you would give to them based on maybe it's your experience playing, maybe it's outside of that, but yeah. what's one piece of advice you would give? I, so I have a 16 year old daughter. She's a low level division, like you Maine, New Hampshire, whatever. That's where she's at. We're coming to Brooklyn this weekend. And I've made all the mistakes from transitioning from the NBA to 10 year olds has been like, what am I doing, right? And they don't pick up this and they don't pick up that. So after, I think, four years of mistakes with young kids, you guys try to get a gym in which, you know, the full court is this way, but you can have side hoops this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, play hours upon hours upon hours upon hours of small groups, three-on-three, small-sided games. Easy for them to process. There's three people out there. The courts are small. Every kid will run back. They play a lot of in the half court. So try, I would like the, the thing that has worked the best moving forward in the last two years have, has been small sided games. And this is, I don't know if it works like this for other sports. Someone gave me the advice that European soccer, their youth program, they do a lot of tight three on three soccer games. 
I tried it. I think it's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I think the kids love it. They play a ton. They get a ton of reps. I had my wife count one time. Count how many times my son touches the ball in 10 minutes on a four-court, five-on-five game. It was 15. In a three-on-three -three game to, uh, for 10 minutes, it was 115. So just add up the reps. You'll get the reps in small-sided courts, and it's, I think it's a lot easier to manage. My only advice, when it, and I don't, like I said, I don't know how other sports are, but for hoops, if you're in, in the basketball world or maybe soccer, reps, 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 touches, touches, touches. That's good. Mm -hmm. I, even, I, even, I even wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, you know, I'll just reinforce what I said before. I, I, think, I, I think it's important to teach your kids multiple sports. Um, I'll just stick with that. I mean, if they're a hooper, get them in the pool, teach them how to swim. Um, if they're a swimmer, get them on the bike, teach them how to ride. If they're a baseball player, you know, put a stick in their hand, teach them how to play lacrosse. I think there's no substitute for being a multidisciplinary athlete, period. Um, there's been, in my opinion, not, never such a time where people are just so locked in from the time, you know, you talk about a floor. I think a lot of parents think about, you know, living through their kids and aspirationally getting their kids an NIL deal and going into college and getting paid and then going to the pros, getting paid more so now more than ever, right? I'm a five-year-old kid that just all of a sudden picked up a ball, that threw the ball like 30 yards. I'm going to be the next great NFL player. So I'm all I'm going to do is teach him football all day long. I think that, I think that is a mistake. That child could become the best lacrosse player, but you never, ever gave him that chance. Now, I will understand and arguably I get it it's it's a uh, it's cost prohibitive sometimes and that's a challenge but there's plenty of other sports out there that don't hardly cost anything you know you can roll up a piece of tape and all of a sudden play baseball you can play handball you can play kickball there's a lot of sports um, so I think being able to cross train is critical when I tore my ACL I got into the pool and I swam Anytime I eat too many bowls of ice cream, I get on my bike and I ride. Um, when I got into the game and I missed a play, yes, I went through my recognized regroup and refocus, but I relied on some of my other sports in order to make me a better football player. When other people were locked into their way of playing, I had a, a strategic way of getting out. So uh, being able to give people multiple choices when they get onto the field is critical, and you can only do that by playing multiple sports. Awesome. Round of applause for these two gentlemen here. <laughs>